Good evening. I'm Mary Pat Higgins, President and CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program, Robbing the Jews, Nazi Confiscation of Property in the Holocaust. I'd like to start this evening by extending a special thank you to everyone supporting this exhibition. Our exhibition sponsors are Dallas Tourism, Public Improvement District, Jewish Federation of Greater Dallas, Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission, and Joanne and Charles Teichman, Elong 23. I'd also like to thank all of our wonderful community partners. Hopefully you saw them listed in the pre-show slide, but we've also just posted in, them in the chat. So thank you all so much for your support of the museum and this exhibition. I'd always like to thank and welcome our members and our board members. We couldn't put on programs like this without you, and we are so grateful for all you do to support the museum. Tonight's program is presented in conjunction with our current special exhibition, The Book Smugglers, Partisans, Poets, and the Race to Save Jewish Treasures from the Nazis. It's on view at the museum through January um, 2nd of 2022. The ex exhibition begins with a central question. Would you risk your life to save a book? It tells the nearly unbelievable story of Vilna Ghetto residents during the Holocaust who rescued thousands of rare books and manuscripts by hiding them on their persons, burying them in bunkers, and smuggling them across borders. I hope that you'll all visit the museum to see this incredible exhibition while it's here. Tonight, we are thrilled to have Dr. Martin Dean with us. Dr. Dean has worked as a researcher for the Special Investigations Unit in Sydney, Australia, and as the Senior Historian for the Metropolitan Police War Crimes Unit in London. While a research scholar at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, he was a volume editor for the Encyclopedia of Camps and Ghettos. His scholarship is what we use to create the map in our permanent exhibition on the camps and ghetto system throughout Nazi Germany. His publications include Collaboration in the Holocaust and Robbing the Jews. He currently works as a historical researcher for the Bobby Yar Historical Memorial Center and as an adjunct professor teaching courses on the history of the Holocaust and World War II at Keene University in New Jersey. We'll leave time at the end of the program as always for questions. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to type out and submit your questions and we'll answer as many as we can. And now it is my honor to welcome Dr. Martin Dean. Thank you so much, Mary Pat, and, and especially to Annie for organizing this, this wonderful event. Uh, it's a great privilege to speak to you. I wish I would have been able to come in person, but uh, this is a very good substitute. I hope you can all hear me clearly. Today, I will examine the Nazi policy of cultural plunder. Just pull up my PowerPoint. Explaining its aims and methods and documenting the vast amounts of possessions stolen by the Nazis. At the same time, I want to show the Jewish response. That is some examples of how Jews defied the Germans' genocidal plans by imaginative forms of cultural preservation and resistance. The work of the paper brigade in Vilna, shown in the exhibit here at the Dallas Holocaust Museum, is just one of the more spectacular episodes in a cultural war that spanned across Europe. Nazi cultural looting began as soon as they seized power. They stole property not only from Jews, but also from organizations they viewed as their enemies, such as the Freemasons and rival political parties. Already on July 14th, 1933, the Nazi government passed new laws banning political parties and initiating the confiscation of the property of communists and enemies of the people in the state. Another law permitted the removal of German citizenship from listed immigrants, which also entailed the seizure of remaining assets in Germany. Among the first people to be denaturalized were political opponents of the Nazis, who also happened to be Jewish. 
Another, um, these included prominent figures such as Albert Einstein and the satirical writer Arnold Zweig. Zweig is famous for his World War I novel, The Case of Sergeant Grisha. When Zweig's household property was seized under the law for the confiscation of property from communists and enemies of the people in the state, Zweig protested vigorously that his apartments and furnishings, as well as the carpets and rugs, certainly did not serve the furtherance of Marxist purposes. The Nazi offensive against Jewish property took many different forms. There were public boycotts of Jewish stores that were accompanied by the discriminatory application of regulations. The Nazis also imposed exorbitant taxes on transfers of money abroad. Harsh application of the new currency laws led increasingly in the 1930s to Jewish bank accounts being blocked and Jewish businesses being placed into the hands of Nazi appointed trustees. Jews were also subjected to arrest, extortion, and the forced transfer of assets to non-Jews. The Nuremberg Laws in 1935 made sexual relations with non-Jews illegal. Jews were excluded from many professions and able to trade only with other Jews. The Kristallnacht pogrom, organized by the Nazi party on November the 9th to 10th, 1938, marked a further escalation of anti-Semitic measures. The Nazis brazenly encouraged the destruction of Jewish property. A major feature of the pogrom was the destruction and burning of synagogues throughout Germany and Austria. In Leipzig, the main synagogue was destroyed by fire on Kristallnacht. This plaque marks where it once stood. The smaller Brody synagogue was also severely damaged. Fortunately, due to an act of resistance, most of the Torah scrolls from the Brody synagogue were saved and managed to survive the war. Chaim Israel, a resident of Leipzig, received an anonymous phone call from Stuttgart on the morning of November 9th, 1938. The caller advised him that violence was planned against every synagogue throughout Germany. He went straight to his own synagogue, the Brody Synagogue and the Keilstrasse, and helped organize the removal of a dozen Torah scrolls. They were transferred to the safety of a building belonging to the Jewish National Fund, which was defined as British property and was unlikely to be attacked. Later, these Torah scrolls were secretly hidden in the beams of Leipzig's University Library, where they were eventually found during renovations in 1998. Presumably those who hid them did not manage to survive. One scroll was subsequently sent to Israel where it can be seen today. On Kristallnacht, thousands of Jewish shop windows were smashed and more than 28,000 Jewish men were arrested. There were also widespread looting during the pogrom, which rarely resulted in, in any punishment. Some Germans referred to it as the night of the long fingers. Indeed, the Gestapo took large amounts of Jewish property into safekeeping, much of which was never returned. In Frankfurt, the city purchased some artworks directly from Jewish owners at bargain prices. While ritual silver was also confiscated from the Museum of Jewish Historical Objects and subsequently sold by the Gestapo. Few Jews had managed to take precautions on this occasion, but their concern not only to emigrate, but also to preserve valuable heirlooms was sharply increased. This wave of destruction and legislation for compulsory agronization soon forced remaining Jewish companies out of business. Another major development was the introduction of the so-called punitive tax in the wake of the destruction wrought by the Kristallnacht pogrom. Hermann Goering literally insisted that the Jews pay compensation for the destruction of their own property. This outrageous measure collected in excess of 1.1 billion Reichsmark, or 25% of Jewish wealth, through a property tax. Jews were compelled to sell property at knockdown prices in order to pay this tax and cover the costs of emigration. The flight tax, taking another 25% of wealth on emigration, also realized more than 900 million from Jewish emigrants 
it's interesting. I was reading a book, a book about 18th century Germany, and they did have a flight tax then, which was kind of a mercantilist measure to stop people from leaving the country. But this uh, 1930s measure, of course, nearly only affected Jews and was enforced um, and, and was effectively raised almost as much as the punitive tax. A further decree was issued in February 1939, ordering Jews to surrender all jewelry and precious metals. Jews stood in line to hand over valuable heirlooms. Hannah Bernheim recalled, there were many people who had suitcases full of marvelous things, old bridal jewelry, Sabbath candles and goblets, beautiful old and modern plates. The most valuable items were sent to Berlin, but the vast bulk was melted down by companies like Degusa, which according to historian Peter Hayes, received around 40% of the Jewish silver from Germany. Smuggling. Another important form of resistance to Nazi measures was smuggling. In her book, Between Dignity and Despair, historian Marion Kaplan documents the brave efforts of Jewish women to evade harsh Nazi customs regulations. Elsie Gerstel paid off the packers to hide the silver while seven Gestapo men were still watching. Other women smuggled jewelry or money abroad for their relatives. When visiting her grandchildren in Switzerland, one grandmother smuggled jewelry on each trip. From, from Berlin, sorry, Alice Berwell, a resident of Danzig, agreed to smuggle her sister-in-law's jewelry from Berlin to Danzig in order to mail it to her when she emigrated. Postal controls had not yet been enforced at this time in the free city of Danzig. Other imaginative ways of circumventing Nazi regulations include exchanges of property with Germans returning from overseas, and some Jewish companies managed to smuggle inventory to branches overseas before their business in Germany was sold or closed down. In the field of art, Nazi looting was a particular danger because of its portability and the high value of paintings. Looting in wartime was nothing new as the French Revolution had established its own commission to plunder artworks from occupied territories, and Napoleon even included the acquisition of art into some of his peace treaties, such as the Treaty of Tolentino. As the clouds of war gathered in Europe in the late 1930s, some Jews sought to save what they could from the Nazis' grasping hands. In France, the Jewish international art dealer, Paul Rosenberg, began moving his collection to his London branch or to storage facilities in the US, South America, or Australia. He also advised his artists to make similar arrangements. Yet in 1940, he still had over 2,000 paintings in France. During the Nazi occupation, he managed to escape with the aid of the Portuguese Consul General, Aracides de Souza Mendes. So there's now a foundation named after him, of course. This beautiful painting by Pierre Auguste Renoir of Mademoiselle Grimprel however, could not be rescued in time. It was seized by the Nazi looting agency, ERR, headed by the Nazi right-wing ideologue, Alfred Rosenberg. It was eventually restituted after the war. Artwork looted by the Nazis in France from Jewish and other collections was sent initially to the depot of the Galerie Nationale de Jeux de Pomme in Paris for registration, sorting and packing. So this is the same place where they took the ten tennis court oath during the French Revolution. The choice pieces were then selected for Hitler's own planned giant art museum in Linz. While other potentates such as Hermann Goering also took their pick. As a former artist, Hitler paid special attention to his own collection and worked with German art experts to assemble it. Once selected, the loop was then packed up and shipped to Germany. French officials estimate that around one third of all art in private hands in France was looted by the Nazis. Public gallery collections were also not protected, as some Jews had tried to conceal their paintings by depositing them with French art museums. The non-Jewish French art historian Rose Vallon worked for the Nazis at the Jeux de Pont in Paris during the occupation. At the risk of her life, 
Ballon kept a secret inventory of the artworks passing through the gallery and their destinations in Germany. With the help of her lists, many important artworks were eventually restituted to their rightful owners after the war. Her devoted record keeping helped to save both the patrimony of France and restore parts of looted Jewish collections. This elegant statue to her now stands in her hometown of Lille. So what was the purpose of the ERR? The Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg or ERR was established as the major Nazi looting agency in May 1941. Among its tasks was the collection of ideological material concerning its enemies, such as the Freemasons, as well as the Jews. As Goering wrote to Hitler in May 1941, the war against Jews, Freemasons and their allies is an urgent task for National Socialism. During the war, therefore, I approved Reichsleiter Rosenberg's special task force in the occupied territories, the ERR, and its mission to seek out and seize research materials and cultural goods belonging to the above mentioned groups and transport them to Germany. This authorization was then used to cover a wide variety of cultural looting, allowing the ERR to call on the assistance of the Wehrmacht and Nazi occupation forces throughout Europe. So you can see the, the web of offices the ERR established. For example, the ERR was deployed to secure furniture and other property seized from Jews in Western Europe, and thereby became a major player in the seizure of artworks. In Western Europe, considerable amounts of Jewish artwork and furniture were exported to Germany for the benefit of Nazi potentates and also bomb victims. In Belgium and France, the ERR participated in the looting of more than 22,000 art objects from more than 2,000 Jewish collections. Some furniture was also sent to equip Nazi offices in Ukraine. ERR records on the looting of Jewish apartments in Belgium and France even ended up in Soviet archives at the end of the war. As we will see in a moment, the ERR also played a similar role in cultural looting in the occupied East. The general pattern in Western Europe was one of well-prepared official confiscations that were coordinated with the deportations. Care was taken not to provoke adverse public opinion, but local participation in the spoliation was quite widespread, if by no means universal. Many people benefited as purchasers, trustees, notaries, administrators, and also so-called Bavaria or minders, false friends who kept property in trust but sometimes did not return it at the end of the war. Some of the Jews in mixed marriages or from mixed backgrounds in France were sent to labor camps, such as three camps in Paris, Austerlitz, Bassano and Levitown, where they were used to sort and pack looted Jewish furniture for the ERR. The sensitive description of the lives of the prisoners who were forced to work in these camps has been written by historians Jean-Marc Dreyfus and Sarah Gensberger. They mention also the corruption of the ER officials who ran these camps and sought to skim off the best items for themselves. The efforts of the Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg organized the collection of vast amounts of Jewish property in Western Europe. For example, in France, by the summer of 1944, 69,619 Jewish apartments had been cleared. The furniture and possessions transported encompass more than 1 million cubic meters, which were sent to Germany on 674 trains, mainly for the benefit of the victims of Allied bombing. In addition, more than 11 million Reichsmark in foreign currency and shares were secured. Some of the shares stolen from the Jews were then sold in neutral countries in order to raise foreign currency to support the German war effort. As were plundered diamonds, and even fur coats. In the wake of the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union, special police units known as Einsatzgruppen initiated the mass shootings of Jews. Much of the property taken directly from Jewish victims at the killing sites was viewed as war booty and was sent directly to the Reichsbank in Berlin. I've seen many reports um, in a special collection that was kept in East Germany, in East Berlin, 
until 1990 when these records were made available. The creation of ghettos witnessed the further rapid deterioration of the material situation of the Jews. Much property was seized during ghettoization and the little that remained was rapidly used up for their subsistence. Finally, the administration of Jewish property in the wake of the mass shootings reveals the considerable German bureaucratic effort that encompassed even attempts to register and claw back property stolen by the local non-Jewish population. In the records of the War Booty Office in Berlin, there are many detailed lists describing property collected directly from Jewish victims in the East, such as this one from Kiev shortly after Babinyar. For example, a massive consignment weighing more than 2,300 kilograms arrived in Berlin from Rivne, Western Ukraine in November 1941. This included objects stolen from the Jewish communities in Koval and Dubno in August of 41 by the Wehrmacht. A similar delivery from Lviv weighing 866 kilograms included large amounts of ritual silver items taken directly from synagogues. German officials demanded contributions from the Jews in gold and silver in very many places. In one case, the head of the Unrat only handed over the ceremonial silverware when the Nazis started to torture his wife. Regrettably, most of these items were melted down for export or industrial use and therefore have been lost forever to posterity. Only in the Czech lands was a large selection of Jewish cultural artifacts gathered by the Nazis with the establishment in Prague of a special museum to document the so-called extinct Jewish race. The Jewish officials that worked there tried to subvert this intention while helping preserve these precious objects. Nearly all of these Jews were deported to Theresienstadt, but the collection was still in existence at the end of the war. This original document sent by Sonder Commander 4A from Kiev lists hundreds of items of jewelry that were literally collected from Jews as they took their last steps into the ravine at Babignar. The list includes 63 ladies' watches, more than 300 rings, and 95 decorative chains weighing in total more than 2.5 kilograms. This was likely only a fraction of the total collected there. So in this photo, which I've studied uh, very intensively for, for months as part of my work at the Babignar Holocaust Memorial Center, is of the clothing that was deposited just before the Jews went uh, literally over this ridge into the, the shooting ravine next door. Here we see members of the SS searching the discarded clothing of Jews at Babinyar for any hidden valuables. They literally sort of changed the orders during the mass shooting to make people take off their clothing because there wasn't time to collect all the valuables. And this was seen as the most efficient way of doing it. The clothing itself was also transported away in trucks and stored in warehouses for distribution to needy ethnic Germans or for sale to the local population. Of course, there was also private theft on a massive scale that accompanied the official looting. The furniture left behind in Jewish apartments in Kiev was also officially confiscated by the German occupation authorities. This meant that non-Jews who moved into the apartments in late 1941 also had to register any property they inherited. They were then given the option of purchasing it or handing it over to the German authorities. In this document, a local inhabitant agrees to purchase former Jewish furniture and to pay for it in six monthly installments. Among the items purchased are one dining table, one bookcase, one small table, and one bed with a mattress. There was also a, a buffet, a child's bed, and a sofa. In Glenboki in Belarus, some Jewish workers were kept alive in the ghetto into 1943. They worked painting signs, as you see here, making shoes, and also sorting Jewish property brought in from surrounding shtetl after the massacres. There were also workshops where things were repaired and restored. The merchandise was recovered from Jewish homes. From these towns were bought whole wagons loaded with crates of utensils and dishes packed in the pages of holy books. Some wagons were quite covered with torn bloody clothing and prayer shawls. Here's a quote from the Glenboki Memorial Book. Before my eyes there again opened a bottomless pit 
into which we had rolled. I entered a few more houses, almost everywhere the same. I encountered furniture from the city, nice beds, chests, mirrors, tables, stools, and grandfather clocks. In one house, I saw two nice buffets. They did not harmonize with the poor peasant houses. Something looked strange, but I wasn't surprised. It was well known that a large portion of the Jewish furniture during the murders had gone to the villages. Indeed, in a number of places, local peasants would drive into town with their carts when they heard rumors of an upcoming action so that they could participate in the plunder as soon as the Jews had been escorted out of town. Even those Jews that survived the war were reluctant to remain in Eastern Europe, which had been converted into a cemetery. When they fled, they were able to take with them only a few reminders of their former life. Chaim Bornstein found this tallet in the burned out home near Drea at the end of the war. A survivor of the Drea ghetto, he carried it with him when he fled west and entered the DP camps in Germany before leaving for the US. So this is a place I've been to myself. This is the synagogue in Mir, uh, and Jack Kagan um, was a, a survivor I got to know in the UK, one of the few Belarus survivors who came to the UK. During the Nazi occupation of Poland and the Soviet Union, both before and during the destruction of the ghettos, hundreds of synagogues were burned down, destroyed and looted. In many places, the Nazis publicly burned Jewish religious books and Torah scrolls. Yet as during Kristallnacht in Germany in 1938, Jews risked their lives and tried to salvage Torah scrolls and cultural heirlooms. In Poland, for example, Jews hid religious books and Torah scrolls in Plotsk. In Lovich, the Torah scrolls were hidden in private homes to save them from being burned in the synagogue. And in Pushkov, Torah scrolls were hidden on the grounds of the cemetery. Further east in Alsetziai, Lithuania, Torah scrolls were saved by the Catholic priest, Dombrowskis, who returned them to a surviving Jew after the war. And in Luna, near Białystok, one Torah was saved from destruction bravely by Keichel Friedman. As Omer Bartov has documented, in many places, the Germans even destroyed Jewish cemeteries. For example, in March 1942, the German authorities ordered the destruction of the Jewish cemetery in Sassiv, east of Lviv. For several months, a number of Jews had to break up the tombstones into small pieces to be used for road construction. However, in return for bribes, the Jews were permitted to retain the impressive owl or tomb of Rebbe Moshe Leib, the Sassiv Rebbe, who had died in 1807, and which thereby survived to be restored again in 1996. Also in Sassiv, some Jewish workers decided to, def to defy the Germans by burying small bottles at the grave sites containing the names of the deceased, so that even without the headstones, the graves would not remain unmarked. Here, ingenuity and piety among the local Jews enabled them to preserve the main function of the cemetery and thwart the German aim of erasing Jewish presence from the landscape. At the St. Martin's labor camp near Poznan, now in Poland, Jewish forced laborers were also forced to demolish a Jewish cemetery. One survivor, Isaac Neumann, recalled that, recalled that one day his work party came upon the headstone of Rabbi Akiba Eiger, one of the great Talmudists of Poland. The Jewish workers put their heads together and decided to rebury secretly that part of the headstone on which Rabbi Akiba Eiger's name was chiseled. So his name would be preserved and remembered. And that is what we did. Two days later, while we distracted the Polish supervisors, Yossel and I quickly, quietly recited the Kaddish as we buried Rabbi Akiba Eiger's name. Once the mass deportation of Jews from Germany started in September 1941, the detailed work of winding up Jewish estates was assigned to the financial bureaucracy under the so-called 11th decree the Gestapo sealed the apartments and collected detailed inventories from the deportees prior to departure. The financial administration then used this documentation to clear the apartments and liquidate remaining ac accounts. Tax officials were in turn to banks and life insurance companies to dissolve the accounts legally with any remaining balances transferred directly to the German state. 
the outstanding obligations and loans demanded an enormous bureaucratic effort. The separate files were kept for each victim to settle up debts. For this reason, deportation lists were created by the Gestapo, so that we still now know almost all the names of those deported from Germany and Austria. Unfortunately, for, for Poland and the Soviet Union, no such lists were, were prepared. In this way, the seizure of Jewish property itself became an integral part of the destruction process. The administration and sale of Jewish property employed hundreds of officials, even at the height of the war. Many contractors and private individuals became involved, such as property assessors, auction houses, trustees, estate agents, notaries, booksellers, transport companies. At the bottom of the food chain, thousands of individuals benefit, benefited from the sale of cheap household items or the availability of apartments, but the Nazis preserved a strict hierarchy of beneficiaries, ranked according to the party's racial priorities. At the same time, rampant corruption ensured that Nazi potentates, as well as police and finance personnel, secured the best items for themselves. During the ghetto clearances in the East in 1942 and 1943, Jewish populations were murdered um, and considerable amounts of furniture were collected and then sorted and sold. In some places, so-called remnant ghettos kept alive a few Jewish workers for several weeks or more in order to process this property. Then also the extermination sites, including Auschwitz, vast amounts of personal possessions were collected and ultimately processed for the benefit of the German war economy, ranging from shoes and textiles to even eyeglasses and human hair. Many survivors carried with them precious photographs of the family members they had lost. I was recently editing a, a personal diary of a survivor from the Warsaw Ghetto, and she had three or four photos that she'd somehow managed to preserve, and these really were the most precious things they ha she had of family members and friends that she could uh, all who had been killed during the war. So the ability to preserve photographs was, was very important to people and they, they literally risked their lives to do this. For example, during the third action in Dashev in Ukraine, in which most of his family were killed, Rivek Sitnik fled to a nearby forest. Yet soon after he risked his life by returning to the family house. There he found out the fate of his loved ones and saw that all of his family's belongings had been stolen. When he met a young girl gathering his family photographs from the floor of his home, he asked her to give them to him, and she did. This is one of the photographs he recovered, a picture taken during happier times before the war in Poland. There were many diverse forms of cultural resistance in the ghettos of Eastern Europe. As many of you know, the Jews of Warsaw, led by Emmanuel Ringelblum, created a secret archive that documented Jewish efforts at survival and also the history of the ghetto. It was buried in milk cans and part of it was recovered at the end of the war. In Kovno ghetto, Rabbi Ephraim Oshri responded to a German order to confiscate books in February 1942 by hiding precious religious texts in various places in the ghetto. Despite the dangers, he continued to consult these texts to help him interpret religious laws in the hostile circumstances of the ghetto. Your only comfort is the book. The Vilna Ghetto Library advertised, your only comfort in the ghetto is the book. The book makes you forget the sorrowful realities. Books carry you to worlds far away from the ghetto. I've read of other survivors who took books with them when they went from ghettos to forced labor camps, and these were some of their most treasured possessions. Herman Crook served as the ghetto librarian in Vilna, which continued to function almost until the end of the ghetto into 1943. He also kept a diary, which he managed to hide in the Kluge labor camp just before he was murdered on the liquidation of the camp and when the inmates were, were shot and then the corpses were burned. His diary was later recovered and provides us with many insights into life in the ghetto. This is one example of the efforts in many ghettos to resist the Germans by acts of documentation to ensure that future generations would learn of their suffering and their unbroken will to remain defiant. The Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg established offices in all the major cities in the East, including Vilna, 
Riga, Minsk, and Kiev. Its officials engaged in cultural looting on a massive scale. One aim of the ERR was to send selected items to the Nazi Academy in Frankfurt for use in opposition research. To sift through the mass of plundered cultural items, the ERR established forced labor brigades of Jewish intellectuals to catalog the materials stolen from Jewish collections. Was this that enabled the paper brigade in Vilna to try to save some of the most precious items from Nazi destruction and plunder? Despite struggling against overwhelming odds and facing almost certain death, brave Jews fought daily to preserve what they could of their heritage. Unfortunately, much of the Nazi plunder was simply pulped or effectively destroyed during attempts to ship it west during the German retreat. Material shipped by the ERR from Minsk made its way in open rail cars to a depot in Ratibor in the Czech Republic, where many of the books, music scores and artworks were exposed to rain and snow on icy railway platforms. Apart from the YIVO collections sent to Frankfurt from Vilna, there were also large scale transports from the Judaica collections in Minsk and Kiev. Even collections of Jewish documents and books in Soviet archives and libraries were subjected to Nazi plunder. As under the Soviets, disused churches were often used by the era to store and sort papers. The materials were first reviewed by members of the Nazi looting task force to determine their value for the Nazi Academy in Frankfurt. Among the collections reviewed in June 1942 were private Jewish archives, index cards with notes on individual Jews, and material about books absent from other European collections of Judaica. In September 1942, the ERR shipped 45,000 Jewish books from Kiev to Frankfurt. Some of this material was eventually restored to Jewish communities after the war through the efforts of the Offenbach Archival Depot, a cultural uh, restoration agency. Items rescued from the Nazi plunder collections were shipped after the war to surviving Jewish communities around the globe to ensure their continued preservation and use. Here, the Committee on Jewish Cultural Reconstruction played an important role. It received custody of items that could not be restituted and determined that they were to be used in the interest of perpetuating Jewish art and culture. By November 1950, the JCRO had distributed some 80,000 books to more than two dozen libraries. The main beneficiaries were the new centers of Jewish life and learning in the US and Israel. I would like to conclude by mentioning a specific example of cultural resistance from one of the many forced labor camps. Isaac Neumann, a survivor from Zedunska Vola, was also a yeshiva scholar described in his memoirs, his experiences, which I've mentioned already, at the St. Martin's camp in Poznan after he arrived there in October 1941. Beginning in February of 1943, the Jews in St. Martin's began preparing secretly to celebrate Passover. When the Jews were not digging, the camp was only guarded by two Poles, one frequently drunk and the other who was all right most of the time. So it became possible to procure various ingredients for the Passover meal. The senior Jew in the camp, or Lager Elterster, the Jewish functionaries, capos, and the inmates all worked together to steal flour from the kitchen, collect drops of wine from emptied bottles, and to bribe a pole to bring them a chicken um, to substitute for the roasted lamb bone. The Jews stored everything in one of the cemetery's mausoleums until the time came to prepare the Seder. They utilized the camp's delousing oven to bake the matzo in the middle of the night. One of the Jews spoke fluent German and the Lager Elterster was able to obtain a German uniform for him to wear and stand guard when the German patrol passed by and questioned the smoke coming out of the chimney. The Seder lasted 30 minutes and no one was caught. Looking back years later, Isaac Neumann, who subsequently became a rabbi and even served briefly in East Berlin in 1987, commented, although we never talked about it with each other or told other inmates about the Seder, I believe that the simple meal of unleavened bread in St. Martin's Cemetery helped us to endure some of our hardships in future camps. 
As time passed, after the war, the meal began to grow in my mind in significance and spiritual power. The lesson perhaps is that acts of cultural resistance have a small, can help us to get through the greater challenges that we face and therefore overcome them in the long term. Thank you for your attention. And I'm ready to take some questions now um, with the help of Annie. Thank you so much, Martin. I am going to stop your screen share real quick. Oh, sure. There we go. I got it. <laughs> All right. We do have a couple questions. And again, if you have any further questions, please go ahead and drop them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you could start, I'm not going to try to pronounce the German, but could you tell us what ERR means in English? Is there an English translation? It's basically, I did have it up on the screen briefly. It's, it's the uh, task force. It's a little similar to the Einsatzgruppe. They said it's Einsatzstab, so the, the deployment or task force um, for cultural looting. It, it's not really translatable. It's one of those German words made up of compounds that it's best to leave it as it is. But I translate it as the either the cultural looting task force or um, the Rosenberg, um, basically his, his personal task force for, for looting property. We have another question, um, an attendee who mentioned that she's read a, a memoir of a woman in hiding in Germany um, that mentioned that the Nazis planned to have a museum about Jews once they were all gone, that was their end goal. Um, and so some of the confiscated items were earmarked for this purpose. She's asking if that's true, is it hearsay, do you know? Yes, I did mention that in the presentation that the museum I referred to was one in Prague. There may have been more, but I, that's the only one that I'm really familiar with. There's been a lot of research on it and we know about it, of course, because many of the items did survive there. There, was, there were Jews obviously working in preparing the collections until uh, near the end of the war when they were sent to Theresienstadt. And that, that, there are several books and articles written about that collection. I think it's probable there were maybe similar, possibly one or two other places did the same thing. It didn't really happen in the, in the East. I mean, these um, collections of the ERR were really for a totally different purpose, but that did preserve some of the Jewish cultural artifacts, unfortunately not the most valuable ones. Mostly, most of the silver, as I mentioned, was sent to um, Berlin and was melted down because it was valuable either for war production or you could get foreign currency for it. Um, so some of that was even may have ended up in Swiss banks as, as gold or silver. Sort of a related question. Is there any evidence or do you know, was any of this program of looting um, a, another form of psychological warfare against the Jews or this dehumanization of Jews? Or was it really about the monetary value of the items? That's a very interesting question. I haven't really thought about that, but certainly the initial policy, of course, was to, to force the Jews to emigrate, although some of the, the, the taxes made that harder rather than easier. So it, it is kind of a psychological war against the Jews. They did everything they could to make them feel unwanted and cultural looting was another aspect of that. I mean, the, the sort of the way they treat it as um, sort of either put it in a museum to sort of remember them after they've gone. Uh, I, I think it was really the idea was as a warning that because of their, their, their totally crazy ideology, they, they did want to sort of reinforce that. Um, so there, there is definitely, it, it's part of the persecution. And I, I, I tend to always draw this link that the, the, the property um, seizure started before the actual killing and therefore it leads up to it so it, it sort of merges into it that you can't really disaggregate the two that one is very linked to the other and even after the Jews had been killed there were still these massive efforts to wind up the property and, and use it for the German war effort and, um, uh, and, and that creates records as well so we, we do know about who was killed certainly in Western Europe through these property records more than from any other source. There was any other, was there any organized looting of property um, with other Nazi vic victim groups? So Roma oh, yes. Sinti, homosexuals, is, is, so this was across the board, not just, not just yeah, focused on- You, you see Jewish almost people. the same type of files and, and auctions taking place when the Roma and Sinti are deported. And I mentioned obviously the, the Freemasons, I perhaps gave them a little bit too much prominence because they, they obviously weren't murdered, but they, they more or less dissolved themselves voluntarily because they knew the Nazis were after them and the Nazis, uh, and the same with the political parties, that the Nazis used basically the um, things like printing presses and um, even particularly property houses um, and also from Jewish organizations, the same thing, synagogues is another one, although the plan for most synagogues was actually they were going to sort of turn them into um, public buildings or even just parking lots in, in most cities 
Um, they didn't actually do much with them during the war because there was kind of a ban on new building because of the war, not because of any kind of uh, desire to retain the, the sort of the shells of synagogues. So there were a few burned out synagogues left at the end of the war. Some of them were turned into parking lots. And then fortunately, fairly soon after the war, they did start the, the business of, of re restituting property. That's, that's, I didn't mention that, but there are, uh, there were in Germany, particularly um, mainly due to the, the pressure of American occupying forces, quite good rules for, for restitution early on. They weren't that enforceable, but this sort of established the principle that then Germany does perform much better than most other countries in terms of restitution and, and compensation, uh, certainly from the mid fifties onwards. It, it's, never, it's never enough, um, but it is something that they did do. Well, and speaking of restitution, we actually have a couple of questions about the Monuments Men, which I think are probably the kind of the most famous example that most of us are familiar with um, for locating and ret returning some of these stolen items through the book or the film. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, whether the Monuments Men or others, you know, how do you even go about returning this stolen property, the, the property that you could return? How, how do you do that? How did that happen? Well, I, it's still going on today, so it just shows how, how complicated it is. And a big problem is that without the sort of provenance records, uh, which in many cases, of course, were destroyed or lost, uh, it's very hard to, to get back to who the original owner was. And that, that and so many things were sold in Switzerland or, or just before the war, or obviously once they've been used to pay taxes. And then um, it's very hard to, to sort of get back the chain of provenance. So that, that's always been the problem. Um, the monuments spent obviously they they tried to gather as much information. You use things like pre-war catalogues. This is one of the key things. And most even most private art galleries they have a catalogue of the items they're trying to sell or that their artists have have, have produced. And those really do help to document who and what when. Of course, there may be gaps in the provenance, and these, these um, are sometimes used by people to sort of justify clinging onto things. Um, but there has been a lot of movement. I, I sometimes question whether it's always worthwhile because often the problem is that the legal costs are so enormous in trying to get something back that you have to sell it again to sort of cover the legal costs. So hopefully more, more work is being done pro bono. Certainly a lot of galleries have become much more responsible and, and even the Austrians have done in the, in the art field at least some very important restitutions recently, which is, is a good thing because their record otherwise on restitution was pretty terrible. So that, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it, it's always hard to re restore things. And, and it will go on and it will be applied to lots of other situations. So we, we now start to see things like works of African art being returned to Africa, which I think is, is good as long as, of course, they're, they're then looked after and treasured as much as, as they would be anywhere else. That's the most important thing. And I know you mentioned it sort of varied by country often, but do you have a sense of when the restitution process began? Was it immediately post-war? Was there a period right after the war where things were just being sold to whoever wanted them? What did that process look like? Was there like a time when it really started becoming a priority? It's very difficult to, to sort of give an overview. It clearly varied by country and, and different countries had different restitution laws. There was actually, I think, a restitution law in, in East Germany for a while and then they sort of stopped doing that because it became more communist. And similarly in Eastern Europe, um, things changed pretty quickly once the Soviets had really got hold of the governments there in 48. In, in the West, there wasn't too much initially, but it does kind of get, get a bit better. Certainly in, in the 90s, there's a second wave. It starts in Western Europe. It's not been as effective in Eastern Europe. So there have been these different waves of restitution. I think Jews did try initially to get things back, but it was always very difficult. And you had this, this problem that very often the houses that they'd lived in, someone else was living there. And they might even still have the furniture, but it's very hard to sort of force your way in there and, and just take the, the sofa back out of your apartment. And when it's gone to someone else's house, it becomes even more complicated. So it's always the problem how you, how you prove something. Some of the most interesting research I did was to, there is a big restitution archive in, in Berlin. And the interesting thing about Berlin that all, I think the whole of Europe, um, was sort of represented in that Berlin archive because it was the main court for anything that wasn't um, on German territory. And if they could, there was a strange, I can't remember exactly what the rule was, but you had to prove that, that the thing had been taken back to Germany. I think that was the, the, the strange rule the Germans had after the war. And I had cases where someone uh, who was from Romania, a Jew from Romania, he, he said he, he saw some of his trees on a platform in Frankfurt. And that was just what would, 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 would get him a compensation from the restitution law. Whether this is true or not, I don't know. They, they did, of course, ship lumber from Romania to, 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 to Germany, but the chances that he would be standing on the platform in Frankfurt when it passed by, I think are pretty small. <laughs> so there might've been a little bit of, of that 
um, um, paid witnesses working in the, some of these cases. But the, the most impressive stuff was sometimes um, servants of Jewish um, households would, would remember particular silver items and, and give testimony on that. And uh, I saw a lot of testimony in these just um, post-war restitution cases, which tell you a lot about the events during and after the war. So it was a fascinating archive to work in. One more restitution question, maybe one more, then we'll move, we'll move on to a couple of others. Is there any way to know what percentage of items that were looted during the war have been returned to either rightful owners or descendants of rightful owners? Is there any kind of tracking on that? Uh, some countries have tried to do it. It's probably easier to do with things like, like um, bank accounts where you have very clear records and, and countries like Norway and um, France have tried to show to what extent it was restituted. And in Norway, there was a problem that they had a, uh, a tax every time something was inherited. And if the whole families were um, didn't return, then it would sort of go through three or four different families and each time they'd take a 10% tax. So I don't know whether they eventually got rid of that law, but so less was restituted in Norway than in France because they were kind of every, every distant relative had to pay more and more tax um, if, if it was going through different family members. Um, but uh, the, it's not easy to say. Um, the percentage is, is probably not as high as we would like it to be. Um, some countries were definitely better than others. In France, the records were fairly extensive. So certainly for bank accounts and a few other items, they were able to record what was taken. And, and some of it was still sitting on bank accounts at the end of the war, even in the Netherlands, a little bit was still on bank accounts because they put everything into one bank in the Netherlands. And then when the Jews were deported, they just sort of converted that into government property. But it did mean uh, that the, the, the records were to some extent available. And that does help with restitution. But of course, where nobody survived, you have this other thing, which is quite interesting. Actually, the Jewish Claims Collection uh, Conference does benefit from, from what's so-called earliest Jewish property, where something's known to have been Jewish, but there no heir could be found. Uh, then that, that goes to uh, the Jewish Claims Conference or other organizations to, to then um, use the, the proceeds to help Jews in need. During your presentation, you talked about, especially in Eastern Europe, um, when Jews were the victims of these mass shootings, often other villagers or people from nearby would move into their houses or claim their items, claim their furniture, um, which of course sort of flies in the face of, of this defense. You know, I didn't know what was happening. We hear that quite a bit from, from bystanders or, or witnesses to the Holocaust. Was that something that you would say was true across Europe? I mean, did people who were either inheriting items or moving into apartments, I mean, did they know what happened to the people who were there before or had this item before them? Yeah, I think Frank Bayot has an excellent estimate that about 100,000 people in Hamburg benefited from Jewish property. So to say they didn't know, and there were adverts in the papers every day saying from former Jewish property items for sale. So uh, there, there is kind of a, um, and it applies on a broader sense of, of general knowledge of the Holocaust. There are also excellent books by people like Bernard Derner, who's shown uh, using court cases that people in Germany during the war knew quite a bit more about the Holocaust than they admitted knowing afterwards. It's kind of a, a collective um, uh, um, amnesia of this particular aspect. I think it's to some, under, some extent understandable, but the property is another uh, good example. There were so many people who um, became aware of it just through this process of of getting money back. So, so people had, in Germany, you have a deposit when you when you have a, an account with the electricity company or when you even rent an apartment, you have a deposit, that money has to be paid back. So people know exactly what's going on when they're involved in these transactions. And, and so the, the level of awareness was definitely more than, than people pretended after the war. Uh, do you know, when you're, have you encountered any evidence of people being able to warn each other what was happening if you were in a town you know, further west than a than another town. Was there any getting of messages to people saying, "Here's what's coming. They're taking our goods. They're taking our items." Have you encountered any of that? Not so much with regard to property. Certainly, obviously, people who were persecuted and managed to flee, they they would talk. I, I'm looking at obviously with the situation in Kiev. There there were a few refugees from from Poland and even from Germany who made it to Kiev, and they they did try to warn people. But unfortunately, the real problem with with the Soviet Union was that because of the Nazi Soviet Pact. The, the Soviets were actually suppressing bad information about the Nazis until, until the war actually started. So this didn't help. And the other problem with um, the occupied Soviet Union is many Jews had actually relatively good memories of the German occupation during World War I. So again, they were not expecting what actually happened. Um, but of course, when, when people started fleeing, they, they did um, pass on the message. And by 1942, this is perhaps the thing that's not so well understood. The ghettos 
um, existed in, in much of Eastern Europe for, for at least six months to a year. And during that period, um, the shootings had already started. So the, the second and, and third waves of shootings, um, people had no real illusions. And, and um, there, there was more resistance for that reason. You get um, in the small ghettos of, of Ukraine and Belarus, there, there were uprisings in 10 or more ghettos that, that were quite well organized and, and quite effective. And in Mir, actually, which we looked at before, um, because they had a secret agent in the police who warned them because he knew exactly when the, when the shooting was going to take place, uh, more than 500 Jews managed to, to flee out of the ghetto, um, but not, not many survived, unfortunately. It looks like we are at our last question. Um, someone is asking, so the, the books and the items that were rescued by the, the paper, paper brigade in Vilna, um, did they all get safely to Yivo or to other locations, or were some of those items still permanently lost to Germans, to Soviets after the war? So yeah, I, I'm not an expert on the Vilna situation. Uh, some did get to, to Frankfurt from you. I think actually with, with Vilna, a lot were still in Lithuania, were only still found in 1990 in, in sort of churches there. Uh, some of it had survived and that has been kind of rescued. I think a little bit did go to Frankfurt. Obviously they, they just selected the best material to go to Frankfurt and some from Yivo got there and did go get sent to Yivo after the war, of course, if they could prove it was, was from Yivo. So it, it's a mixed story. Some of the stuff sort of buried in the ghetto because the whole, um, the ghetto was more or less destroyed. I think um, that may not have been the smartest way to preserve things, unfortunately, but they didn't know that at the time. Was, the aim was to keep it from the Germans. Yeah. And I'll, I'll use that question as a shameless plug for our next program related to this exhibit. If you're interested in learning more, on November 1st, we'll have Dr. Richard Freund, who will talk about his archaeological excavations with the Great Synagogue and the Strachan Library in Vilna. So hopefully he'll be able to answer some more of our questions about what they've found since then as well, because they're still excavating that site and um, finding more and more every day, I think. So we hope you'll join us for that. But uh, I think that wraps us up for this evening. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Dean. You were exactly on time, which is always impressive, um, but we appreciate you sharing with us tonight um, a lot of really interesting information that I'm sure many of us have are less familiar with. So we appreciate that. Thank you all for watching tonight. Uh, we hope to see you at a future program. You can always visit our website, dhhrm.org, to see what we have coming up. But otherwise, have a great rest of your evening. Everyone stay well and stay safe. Thanks again, Dr. Dean. Thanks, Ali. That was, it was my pleasure. Good night.